Our interest is in capturing the electrical and mechanical transients, i.e. temporary events that occur during synchronization. In this scenario, we set up the generator to produce light industrial 60 Hz three phase AC with 120 volts line to neutral and 208 volts line to line. Considering an oscilloscope trace for line current for one phase through the contactor, generator electrical power for one phase, and generator torque. When the contactor is open, no current flows into the contactor, the generator exports no electrical power, and the generator produces a token amount of negative counterclockwise counter torque in opposition to the clockwise moving prime mover accounting for friction. At the time when the phase sequence, frequency, phase shift, and voltage magnitude of the generator matches that out of the grid, I close the contactor and nothing happens. I.e. there's no current surge into or out of the generator, there's no massive exchange of electrical power, nor does the generator experience an oppositional braking or motor torque. It's not dramatic and that's the point. The generator and grid match each other at the moment of synchronization. This is how it's supposed to happen, but it is not the reason you're still here. You're here to see me break this thing, which is exactly what I'm going to do. This is actually one of my favorite labs because I get to answer that burning question that is in the back of everyone's mind when they first learn about generator synchronization. What happens if you screw it up? Let's find out. Now keep in mind I'm doing this on a tiny little 200 watt machine purposely designed to handle rough treatment and not some multi-million dollar 75 megawatt beast performing mission critical power generation capacity at some federally funded facility. If you do what I'm about to do on a bigger machine, expect much, much greater consequences on the order of catastrophic mechanical and electrical disruption, personal injury, severe death, and major financial liability, not to mention the loss of your career in the rare event you do survive. In summary, do not try this at home. Consider an occasion what happens when I close the contactor when the generator matches grid phase shift frequency and voltage, however the rotor is lagging 30 degrees behind the stator at the time of closure. What happens? Electrically, there's a momentary surge of current and electrical power into the machine. Mechanically, the shaft experiences a surge of clockwise torque in the previously established direction of rotation. Makes sense. The rotor's behind and the grid says, hurry up, dummy, and pulls it forward as would a motor. You note the zero center line of torque measurement is right here, so there's two zero crossings where it goes from a tiny amount of negative counterclockwise torque accounting for friction, goes clockwise momentarily, and then settles back to the original amount. Not the ideal scenario, but all in all, not too bad. Let's make it worse. Consider an occasion what happens when I close the contactor when the generator matches the grid phase shift frequency and voltage, how the rotor is an increased 60 degree lag behind the stator at the time of closure. As previously electrically, there's a momentary surge of current and electrical power into the machine, only more dramatic in magnitude. Again, mechanically, the shaft experiences a surge of clockwise torque, only greater in strength. Given the rotor is further behind this time, the grid treats the lagging generator as a motor and gives it a strong yank forward. We are definitely in the danger zone now, both mechanically and electrically. In summary, a greater mismatch results in greater undesirable electrical and mechanical transients. Let's make it worse. Consider an occasion when I close the contactor when the generator matches grid phase shift, frequency, and voltage magnitude. However, the rotor is a full 90 degrees lagging behind the stator at the time of closure. This is bad. Electrically, there's a supermassive surge of current and electrical power into the machine, and mechanically, the shaft experiences a large surge of clockwise torque. As previously, the grid is yanking the lagging rotor forward, as would a motor, only this time with a degree of viciousness. Besides increasing the magnitude of the electrical and mechanical transients, you'll notice greater and greater mismatches also result in longer durations of undesirable electrical and mechanical transients. Let's approach this from a different direction. What happens if the road is leading the stator at the time of closure? We should observe opposite effects. Let's see if this is the case. Consider an occasion what happens when I close the contactor when the generator matches grid phase shift frequency and voltage, however the rotor is leading 30 degrees ahead of the stator at the time of closure. Electrically, there's a momentary surge of current and electrical power out of the machine, and mechanically, the shaft experiences a surge of counterclockwise torque against the previously established clockwise direction. It makes sense. The rotor's head and the grid is saying, not so fast, dummy, and pulls it backward as would a break. Not the ideal scenario, but all in all, not too bad. Let's make it worse. Consider an occasion what happens when I close the contactor when the generator matches the grid phase shift, frequency, and voltage magnitude, 
However, the rotor is an increased 60 degrees ahead of the stator at the time of closure. As previously, electrically, there's a momentary surge of current and electrical power out of the machine, only more dramatic in magnitude and sustained in nature. Again, mechanically, the shaft experiences a surge of counterclockwise braking torque, only greater in strength. Given the rotor is further ahead this time, the grid breaks the rotor more aggressively. A greater mismatch results in greater undesirable electrical and mechanical transients. Let's make it worse. Consider an occasion when I close the contact or when the generator matches phase shift, frequency, and voltage magnitude, however the rotor is a full 90 degrees ahead of the stator at the time of closure. Electrically, there's a supermassive surge of current and electrical power out of the machine, and mechanically, the shaft experiences a large surge of counterclockwise braking torque. So large, in fact, we've jumped off the oscope screen at our present scale. When I rescale it to 0.2 newton meters per division, it looks like we're just shy of negative 0.5 newton meters braking torque. Vicious indeed, and not a recommended practice. As previously, besides increasing the magnitude of the electrical and mechanical transients, you notice a greater and greater mismatch results in longer and longer durations of undesirable electrical and mechanical transients. Are we done torturing this machine? Not remotely. What's the worst possible match you could imagine? 180 degrees? Yeah, let's do it. If this thing breaks, it's your fault. Given the rotor is totally opposite the stator, it'll be a 50-50 chance if it acts like a motor or a generator. Place your bets and let's see what happens. Bam, oh, this is bad. When I close the contactor, the machine makes this awful sound like it's getting dragged through a knot hole backwards. Looks like we're deep, deep, deep in generator mode with the grid aggressively breaking the rotor backwards and a massive spike electrical current and power. This is probably the worst thing that could happen if this is a large expensive machine, you might be picking up the pieces and looking for a new job. In summary, do not try this at home. The only time you ever close a contact or separating a generator from the grid is when the generator matches the phase sequence, phase shift, frequency and voltage magnitude of the grid. All right, that was fun. Let's wrap this lecture up with a quick discussion of how once synchronized to the grid, a generator can meet the electrical power needs of grid-connected electrical loads. Once synchronized, ideally properly with minimal electrical and mechanical transients, a generator is essentially placed to parallel the grid and is said to be floating, i.e. producing no power. As viewers are no doubt aware, electrical power is two dimensions, real and reactive. Let's deal with real power first. As a major, major summary of the process, in order to export real electrical power, a generator needs to start consuming more mechanical power from the prime mover. However, given the massive inertia of the grid, a tiny, tiny generator, once synchronized to the massive grid, cannot change its rotational speed. This being said, you will recall mechanical power has two aspects, speed and torque. Given rotational speed is fixed, once synchronized, a prime mover essentially needs to start exerting more and more torque, such that it delivers more and more mechanical power. Increased amounts of torque result in the rotor remaining in sync with the stator, however slightly leading it. The more torque, the more it leads, and the more real electrical power is exported to grid. Given motors and generators are essentially opposing natures of the same machine, you can almost think of this as the opposite of load torque for synchronous motors. As you no doubt recall, a synchronous motor remains synchronized to the grid, however increasing degrees of load torque make the rotor lag further and further behind, thus in motor mode it consumes more electrical power and produces more mechanical power. In generator mode it's totally opposite. In generator mode, a synchronous machine exporting more real power to the grid remains synchronized to the grid, however increasing degrees of prime mover torque make the rotor lead further and further ahead. Thus, in generator mode, it consumes more mechanical power and produces more electrical power. Speaking of opposite natures, you remember how field current affects the reactive power nature of a synchronous motor? Well, check it out. Field current also affects the reactive power nature of a generator, only it does so in reverse. As you no doubt recall, at low levels of field current, an underexcited rotor makes a synchronous motor appear as if it was an inductive load, such a current lags voltage. Conversely, at high levels of field current, an overexcited rotor makes a synchronous motor appear as if it was a capacitive load, such that current leads voltage. Generators aren't loads, they're sources, so this relationship is flip-flopped. In generator mode, at low levels of field current, an underexcited rotor makes a synchronous generator supply negative reactive power, such that current leads voltage. 
Conversely, at high levels of field current, an overexcited rotor makes a synchronous generator absorb positive reactive power, such that the current lags voltage. Why? I'd tell you why, but I don't have time and neither do you. Long story short, it deals with a simplified model of a generator winding we employed in the Loaded Synchronous Generators lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. You recall, this simplified model employed a voltage source resultant from the generator electromotive force in series with a small resistor and comparatively larger inductive reactants. If isolated from the grid, we learned that adjusting field current directly affected output voltage magnitude at the terminals of the generator. However, once synchronized to the grid, the voltage of the output terminals of the generator would remain fixed by grid imposed voltage. Any adjustment to the field current after synchronization affects the generator electromotive force only, thus controlling the degree of differential between the generator electromotive force and grid voltage, thereby affecting the current flow through the resistive and reactive components internal to the winding. Thus, under excited conditions, current leads voltage, and in overexcited conditions, current lags voltage. All right, I am dropping it right there. That was the super, super condensed version about exporting real and reactive power once synchronized. Trust me, you do not want the full version. Seriously, I dragged integrals and differentials around for a full 15 week semester every day, stabbing a pencil into my palm just to stay awake in class, and I used it zero times. I did this so you don't have to. Just kidding, I do want to discuss one more tiny detail about reactive power and field current. As with synchronous motors, you'll note there's a point on the field current versus reactive power plot where the generator neither supplies nor absorbs reactive power. This is an operating condition where the generator exports only real power. As we learned in the synchronous condenser lecture, by adjusting field current, a synchronous condenser could act as a dynamic power factor correction element, counteracting the reactive needs of other loads. This begs the question, could a generator do the same thing? Sure, why not? In this fashion, an electrically excited generator can export real power to the grid and power factor correct the grid. Pretty cool, huh? Often one or more turbines in a large collection of turbines at a hydropower facility or system is reserved exclusively for this power factor correction role, and by dynamically adjusting field current, it will thus balance reactive power requirements for the grid. All right, let's bring this lecture to a close. In conclusion, we examined generator synchronization. We learned generators can be synchronized with the grid only when their phase sequence, phase shift, frequency, and voltage magnitude match that of the grid. Additionally, we discussed how synchronization lamps and synchroscopes can be used to manage synchronization events and observed how improperly managed synchronization can generate undesirable electrical and mechanical transients. Finally, we learned how generators, once synchronized with the grid, export real and reactive power to the grid. Once synchronized, rotational speed remains fixed, however, increases in torque result in generation of more real electrical power. Similarly, once synchronized, voltage remains fixed, however, adjusting field current changes the reactive nature of exported electrical power. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of this series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.